You are listening to the podcast of the Maciasz Korvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinak.hu slash en. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Greenlight, the podcast series of Climate Policy Institute. Today's guest is Stephen E. Koonin, physicist by training, professor of the NYU in climate science and energy, as well as author of the most recent release of MCC Press, Unsettled. Professor, thank you for accepting our invitation. Pleasure to be talking with you, Mon. In your book, you make the statement that the most crucial questions around climate change are not scientifically settled, even though many climate scientists and the majority of the media tries to deliver the opposite message. Regarding climate change, what issues have you found not to be settled? Well, there are many uh, things about the climate that we have yet to understand. One of the most fundamental is how sensitive is the climate both at the global and local levels, to growing human influences. Human influences are growing as greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere. And a central question is, how will the temperature, storms, precipitation, droughts, all that sort of thing, how will those change in ways that they might not have changed if humans weren't influencing the climate? And then there's the issue of how do those changes affect society and ecosystems? And as you go down that chain from human influences to changes in the climate to impacts, uh, the uncertainties grow. You claim that the first IPCC report was your gospel, or at least its complete form, but its briefings and uh, its shortened versions are biased. So I'd like to know what important elements uh, these briefings contain and what do they omit? So the briefings at some level um, are derived from the bigger reports, the longer reports. But they are selective. And let me just give you one example. If you look at the summary for policymakers of the most recent report, the so-called AR6, it has one sentence about the impact of rising temperatures on fatalities, deaths around the world. And what it says is that rising temperatures contribute to a growing number of fatalities. And that's completely true. It's a factual statement, but it's factually incomplete. Because in fact, although deaths from extreme high temperatures are growing, deaths from extreme low temperatures are falling because the low temperatures are not as severe. And the deaths from low temperatures are nine times bigger than the deaths from high temperatures. So as the global temperature rises, in fact, fewer people are dying from extreme temperatures. Yet, and that's in the literature, it's in the report somewhere, but it's completely omitted from the summary. It's that kind of distortion, misleading, that unfortunately characterizes the summaries. Those seem to be reports that are written to persuade rather than to inform. Uh, Thank you. Uh, You've also stated multiple times that there is no climate emergency currently. And I believe it's quite a strong statement in an environment where most of the media uh, is saying the opposite. So I'd like to know what you base your statement on. Well, if you look at the research literature and the IPCC reports, If you look at the economic dimension, for example, you see that they project an economic impact of a few percent for a few degrees of warming. So if the warming were to, let's say, be three degrees above pre-industrial, remember the Paris Accord is two degrees or below, ideally one and a half. So if you go to three degrees, which is even more, the projected impact on economic activity whether worldwide or national for the U.S., is less than 3%. It's 2%. And that's as much as the economy grows in a single year. 
often. So first of all, the economic projections are expected to be minimal. Now you might argue, um, you know, that's not the only thing that matters, money, but still, uh, better that it be small, which it is. The second is we can go by experience. If you look from 1900 until now, the globe has warmed by about 1.3 degrees. About the same amount of warming is projected over the next century. Since 1900, despite the warming, we have seen the greatest improvement in the human condition ever. The population went up by a factor of five. The lifespan went from 32 years to 72 or 73 years. GDP per capita went up by a factor of seven in constant dollars. And the death rate from extreme weather events went down by a factor of 50. And it's really hard to believe that another 1.3 degrees at the same rate is going to significantly derail that improvement. We are a wonderfully adaptable species. Yes, I couldn't argue because humans most certainly aren't, uh, hopefully, uh, most other species too, but you still haven't mentioned environmental impacts of fossil yeah, warming and, 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 and climate change. I think, change. you know, again, we've seen about the same amount of warming um, over the last 120 years. Uh, I'm sure that there will be some areas that will be adversely impacted, but there will be other areas that will be opened up. Nature does a great job of healing itself. And, and of course, you know, we, we've seen large temperature swings uh, just due to natural phenomena over the last 100,000 years. So na nature finds a way. That's, uh, um, that's what it does. So these projections that seem to make you, uh, I'm not saying too optimistic, but still not too pessimistic, uh, do they include uh, tipping points, possible tipping points, and what could... Uh, the effect of these could be in the near or uh, far future? That there, um, of course, there are a variety of tipping points that people have considered, including outgassing of the permafrost in the Arctic, uh, slowing down of the Atlantic circulation, dying off of the Amazon, and so on. Uh, the models show no indication of this, but some of the economists have analyzed what the economic impact would be of those tipping points, either singly or in um, combination. Uh, published in 2021 in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And what you find is that there are another percent or two uh, on top of the one or two percent. So we're still talking about on the scale of other things that affect the economy like regulation, technology, demographics, trade, um, these are pretty small. Uh, don't you believe that other effects, again, uh, once again, economic impacts uh, could be probably uh, accurately measured, but other impacts of these tipping points could be more severe? Uh, could be. I mean, you know, the future is certainly uncertain. You have to weigh the likelihood and the severity of those impacts against the other dimensions I mentioned, namely the need to provide energy for most of the world and the difficulties in making a rapid energy transition. Other things being equal, you'd say, sure, let's reduce emissions. Unfortunately, other things are not equal. Thank you very much. Uh, so in your book, you make the claim that the Earth re radiates uh, over 200 watts, if I'm not mistaken, 239 watts of heat, yeah. uh, right. of heat energy uh, per square meter, while human influences account to just over 2 watts per square meter. And there's something I'd like to clarify here, because for some readers, uh, especially readers uh, not uh, well knowledgeable in physics, uh, this might sound like anthropogenic effects only account for 1% of the warming, while the way I see it, your claim stands closer to the statement that uh, we are responsible for about 1% of the total heat. So let's say if global average temperatures rise from uh, 12 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius, that is uh, 285 degrees Kelvin to 288 Kelvin, that means a roughly 1% change in heat energy. 
So while it might seem tempting that we are responsible for 1% of warming, in reality, that should be higher and uh, that should be clarified. Yeah, so, so it's 1% of warming when we measure the temperature on the Kelvin scale, which is what's relevant for heat. Uh, on a physical scale, of course, if we warm from 12 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius, that's a, that can be a big deal. So, uh, but when we build the models, the models physically deal at the Kelvin level. And so you need to build a very precise model and need to have all of the external influences accounted for accurately in order to isolate the 1% effects of human influences. Yes, but uh, what I would just like to clarify for people not so deep in physics like myself is that uh, we're responsible for 1% of the heat energy that distinguishes us from zero Kelvin, so absolute zero. But we're not responsible for 1% of the few degrees of warming oh, no, that we're no, experiencing no. right we, now. You know, the, some of the scientists say we're responsible for all of the few degrees yes. of warming. Uh, there's still, of course, quite a bit of controversy about exactly how much that there is, uh, how much we were responsible for of that three degrees, but it's certainly a lot more than 1%. Uh, what's your opinion that I mean? I think it's probably at least half. At least half. Okay. Okay, so... I mean, there, there, there is goes. some influence. It, it's pretty clear that's basic physics. But the point is that the response of the system to that influence and the presence of other influences are rather uncertain. So in yesterday's lecture, you repelled unnecessary climate uh, projections and said we should do less computing, more thinking. Uh, I would like you to elaborate on that and... Uh, Tell me, does it not sound a bit anti-progress for you, if you put it that way? No, not at all. Um, because, uh, you know, if you're if you're trained as a scientist as opposed to a computer person, the simulations become a tool to let you better understand. If you're trained as a computer person, the simulations are just the answer. And often you look at the answer, and um, if, if you're of the second school, you look at the answer and say, that's the answer, without thinking about does this make sense or not, how sensitive is it to the assumptions I make, and so on. So there needs to be more, I, you know, I'm getting old enough, I hate to say it, old school style dissection thinking of the results and less of just generating more and more results. Let me give you just one example. Yeah, of I mean, course. People are starting to explore the sensitivity of the models to changes in how you start them. You've got to start, you know, if you're, let's say, simulating from 1950, you've got to say, what's the ocean doing at every little voxel in the simulation in 1950, because we don't know that, so you have to make assumptions. So how sensitive is it to those assumptions just beginning to be explored? Could you uh, make it a bit more detailed what you mean by thinking? Because, you know, projection is uh, quite a concrete, uh, well understood uh, notion, but what do you mean by thinking exactly? Thinking means you understand in detail the mechanisms and can get a good intuition. If I were to turn this knob in the simulation uh, a little bit, how will it affect the results? I mean, um, again, in other physical systems that people simulate, for example, the flow of air around uh, an airplane, which is done in simulation, the people who do those get a really good physical feel for how it works and how things change if you change various, the shape of the wing or something like that. We don't really have that yet for the climate system. In, le in yesterday's lecture and just shortly in your previous answer, you've mentioned the role of uh, the oceans and you, you've claimed that uh, climate actually happens in the oceans. Uh, could you please elaborate that and uh, tell us a few details on 
why uh, climate happens on the oceans and what's the role of the oceans in our climate on land as well? I mean, the climate system consists of really four um, components. One is the atmosphere, which is where weather happens. Another, the oceans. A third is what's called the cryosphere, which are the ice sheets and the mountain glaciers and the sea ice. And then the fourth is the solid earth. Uh, and of those components, the atmosphere has the fastest time scale. Weather changes every few days. The atmosphere becomes chaotic after about a week, which is why it's hard to do weather prediction beyond a week or so. The time scales for the ocean are much longer. If we just take the upper 50 meters of the ocean, which has got pretty much a uniform temperature, it's called the mixed layer as you go down, um, it's got a time scale of about 10 years just due to the way heat flows through the water. Uh, so it remembers on the scale of 10 years. And then there are currents in the ocean, some of which are very deep, that have up to a thousand year time scale. And the ocean, in some sense, provides the, the boundary on which the atmosphere does its thing. And so we need to understand how the ocean changes and what it was doing over the last century or so, if we're going to do a good job of projecting climate out a uh, century or so. Uh, why, do he, why do we have a poorer understanding of uh, climate on the oceans uh, well, compared to uh, climate on land? Yeah, it's pretty easy to measure the temp surface temperature of the ocean these days with satellites. Before that, before we had satellites, it was ships that sailed along. It was incomplete coverage. You only covered the shipping routes uh, that were perhaps not very accurate because you lowered a canvas bucket over the side, pulled up some water, and stuck a thermometer in it. Um, so our coverage of the oceans, even uh, at the surface, was pretty spotty uh, up until some number of decades ago. Our knowledge of the deep oceans is very spotty. Uh, it has improved greatly over the last 15 years with a system of floats that 5,000 of them or so that drift around the ocean and measure the temperature down to a kilometer or so. But we need that kind of data for 30, 40, 50 years in order to start to understand what the system is doing. And my last question is a bit provocative. So I would like to know uh, what your answer should be to people who, having read or not having read your book, called you a climate change denier. Yeah. So um, first of all, uh, what do I deny, right? I mean, humans, the climate's changing, certainly. Um, humans are influencing that change through growing greenhouse gases and aerosols in the atmosphere. I think what I differ from what the media or politicians will tell you is this is not a crisis uh, and that there are other th things you have to weigh, like energy poverty, uh, the difficulty in energy transition, as you go about trying to thinking about reducing human emissions. Uh, the book I have intentionally written to draw upon only the official sources or the data. And so in many ways, it's not my science in the book, but it's what the science really says. And of course, I provide references, links to all of the original source material. So if you think I'm denying something, I'm just telling you what the official science is. Uh, I'm hardly denying it. Professor Kunin? Thank you very much for being here with us today and answering my questions. I also thank everyone for listening to Greenlight. Please join us for our next podcasts and follow Climate Policy Institute on social media. Thank you for listening to this MCC podcast episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at korvinek.hu en.